alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began and ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes over me you have made me It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, oh your grace so free washes over. your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you our savior displayed on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, oh your grace so free washes. Of all the redeemed, yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested, and my life began. Oh, we're free, free forever, we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed, yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested, and my life began.
excited about Easter. Yes, yes, Easter yes, is yes. every day for us. It's awesome. We got a lot here today, so can you get your Bibles out? Let's make the devil nervous. Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I can have. I can have. What the Word of God. What the Word of says God. Says I can have. Says I can have. I can do. I can do. What the Word of God. What the Word of God. Says I can do. Says I can do. And I am. And I am. What the Word of God. What the Word of God. Says I am. Says I am. Isn't that just awesome? God's Word is so powerful. Uh, just real quick, just thinking about how often I eat every day, and you can see that I eat every day. <laughs> but what if we had a picture of how often we eat spiritual food? Would our physical bodies look as good as our spiritual bodies? So it's important we're here today, and it's important we eat God's Word every day. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for your Word. It is life. It is health to us. It transforms us. So we thank you that we can dive into your word today. We treasure it. We honor it. And we live it. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us and showing us in Jesus' name. Everyone say it. Amen. 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 All right. Title of our message, Daniel's Prophetic Countdown to Palm Sunday. What? <laughs> so, yeah, that's a lot to unpack. So let's get busy with it. Um, Need my seat up? There are 77s in the portion of Scripture that we're going to go over. Uh, so let's open up real quickly in Isaiah 46, verse 9 through 11. And this just kind of brings some amazing revelation to us in the time that we are living in. So here we go. It says in verse 9, Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Don't you know God is good? He shows us things. He doesn't leave us in the dark, that we're clueless of what is happening, what's coming down the road in history. He shows us, and he knows it even before it happens. And uh, that is a powerful thing, and that's what we want to unpack today in Daniel chapter 9. One of the most prophetic book chapters in the entire Bible is found in Daniel chapter 9. So I'm just going to say this. Those watching and those in the room, you are going to have to actively keep your mind going because there's a lot in Daniel chapter 9. Can you do that? Can you actively keep your mind engaged? Because there's so much here. So just real quick, Daniel was uh, a teenage boy that uh, was taken captive from Jer uh, Israel, Jerusalem, and was brought into Babylon. How many remember the stories of Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all that? So Daniel was taken out of his homeland and moved to, many believe, Iran, which is where Babylon was located, in Persia. And uh, he was a foreigner living in this land. But through God's grace, he rose to a place of prominence in a foreign country. Uh, he survived four different government administrations and uh, was a major figure in, uh, in the move in the workings of government. It's powerful. And uh, so... So right here, when we get to chapter 9, so the, if you're reading Daniel, you're going to read all about that in the first part of the book. When you get to chapter 9, here he has now gone through 4, and he is now in his 80s. And he is reading the prophetic words of the book of Jeremiah. And as he's reading Jeremiah, it's like a light bulb comes on to him. Because Jeremiah, the word of God is just a lot of prophetic word, if you don't realize that. So as he's reading Jeremiah, it was already prophesied that they were going to be in captivity because of, well, I'm not even going to get into that. They, they, well, actually, we, we do want to talk about that, don't we? Yeah, it's pretty we significant. We do. It's, it's significant. So you all remember that God said you're to keep the Sabbath, right? Okay. So 
that meant that the seventh year they were supposed to give that as a tithe, the land, and the land was supposed to rest. Only what happened is the children of Israel got a little bit in anxiety and stress about their finances and thought, if we do that, we're not going to have enough. Boy, this sounds like Christina's offering message. And so they did not rest the land on the seventh year. And they didn't rest the land for 490 years. In other words, that seventh year, they just kept tilling the land. They kept doing it. That, that didn't go over big with God. And so God had a forced Sabbath, and they went into captivity for 70 years. So Daniel, to make up for those. So Daniel is in his 80s, and he's like reading Jeremiah, and he's praying about it. And he's like, wait, I was about 15 years old when this thing went down. I'm in my 80s. This 70-year judgment that we left Israel, it's coming to an end. So he begins praying about this. And that's where we begin in chapter 9. So if you're turning your Bibles to chapter 9. So the 490 years... If you divide that by seven, you come up with 70 years. That's why the, there were 70 years of captivity. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, uh, just uh, open this up. During the first year of his reign, which was King Darius, new administration, I, Daniel, learned from the reading of the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet, which we just kind of talked about, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So he goes into this amazing prayer. I encourage you to read it. And then we get into uh, verse 20 of chapter 9, and this is where we want to camp out a little bit. Okay. So we are going to camp out in starting in verse 20, and we're going to camp out in now what we're going to, is the 70 weeks prophecy. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, Jerusalem. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. We'll come back to that evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Everybody say, skill to understand. Skill to understand. This morning, I want you to have some skill to understand what's about ready to be presented. Verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Do you see that again? Understand the vision. God wants you this morning to understand this prophetic vision we're about ready to, to get into. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand. Do you see it again? Know and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until... Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Everybody say one week. one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the abominations shall be one who makes desolate. 
even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Now, there's a lot in that scripture that we are going to try to explain. <laughs> as quickly as possible. <laughs> so, the 70 weeks in the Hebrew translation uh, is a couple words. 70 is, I don't know, probably butchering up the Hebrew, but, but shav, shav, shavim? I love to spell it because then if I don't pronounce the Hebrew correctly, it's S-H-A-V-U-I-M. I say shavum. Shavum is 70 and shavim is seven. So, 77s. Uh, we got weeks in the English translation because there's seven days in a week, just to cut that. But it says 70 weeks are determined. That word determined means to cut and divide. And so, out of history, God cut and divided some time frames. So, there's first uh, seven. Notice there were seven. And then there were 62. Seven plus 62 is what? 69. Nine. And then everybody's uh, scared to do math this morning. So the first cut is seven. The next cut is sixty-two, and then the last cut is one one week. And uh, conservative scholars and uh, Christian and both Jewish scholars believe the seventy weeks. It's the cutting of seventy is years. So if we go into this. It, Gabriel announced the 77s is to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring righteousness everlasting, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy, and to restore Jerusalem. There's seven pieces to that. So who's the most holy? Does, does everybody at least figure out that part? It's Jesus. The most holy is Jesus. So this is a clear prophetic word of when Jesus would come. Yes. And so to seal up the vision and the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary, the temple, in verse 26, the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, the prince is translated ruler or reigning military leader, if you will. And there was a flood in 70 A.D. We know the time, 70 A.D., Jerusalem was invaded by a Roman legion. A flood of military came in, and they desolated Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. How many know there is no temple in Jerusalem today? And there hasn't been a temple in Jerusalem since 70 A.D. when Titus came in and desecrated and, and mass murder, and it was a horrible time. So this prophecy kind of ends with that. So between some time frames, Jesus is going to come before the the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed. Are you following me? So, the 69, <laughs> 7, and then 62 is 69. And if you multiply that times seven years, track with me, it's eight or 483 years. Why is this significant? It's significant because if you go back, it says, until the decree to restore Jerusalem... We know when that took place. Fight Club, guys, we have a, a verse that we hang on to out of Nehemiah that we will fight for our family, our wives, to rebuild our homes and all that to, to make secure. Artaxerxes, who Nehemiah served, made a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. On God's timetable, and this is after Daniel, God started the, the clock. So you start counting from that time in 444 B.C., and the clock is running. The first seven weeks took 49 years to rebuild Jerusalem under Nehemiah, and then it went into the 62 weeks, which is very interesting. And how many know that from... Um Micah to when we have the Gospels, I'm sorry, from Malachi to the Gospels, that there's, there's what we call a quiet period. And so this prophecy is including that quiet period. And if you do the math, which if you, I mentioned earlier, my husband and I were doing a lot last night and we were literally had our calculators out and we were doing the math. And if you do the math, it comes right up to Palm Sunday 
when Jesus was announced and was on the donkey and the palm trees were going. And it, I, I'm telling you, it, it ought to put goosebumps on you. I mean, my hair is probably even standing up right now. It still gives me goosebumps. How precise the Word of God is. It's just like, wow, wow. It is amazing uh, when we realize that. It's One thing I want to say about the calculator, though, is that people do need to understand that there are there is a Jewish calendar and there is a... a Our Gregorian Yes, thank you. Calendar. That's what I was looking for. And Not so you do Gregorian. have those, a few dates you have to calculate in. So in verse 25 there it says, from the going forth of the command to restore Jerusalem, which we know from history is March 14th, 40, 445 B.C., the clock started. 49 years to restore, and then it goes on into tabulate all those numbers up according to the uh, Hebrew calendar, brings you to Palm Sunday when Jesus entered. And when Jesus entered on a donkey, the Bible says he wept over Jerusalem, and he said something referring to Daniel's prophecy. He said, I'm crying over you, city of Jerusalem, because you missed the hour of your visitation. You didn't understand the prophecies concerning me, and you've rejected me. And really what he was saying, because you've rejected me as your Lord and Savior, Rome will come and destroy this. And he prophesied about it. He said, not one stone in this temple is going to remain. Some powerful stuff here. And when we understand the magnitude of God's preciseness, it's may. It should put us in awe that God is accurate. He's calculated. He understands you. When Daniel began to pray, God visited him. He brought him revelation and understanding. And when you and I pray, he wants to bring you understanding and knowledge and visitation. And his time frames are perfect. Because of this, we can trust in Almighty God. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that last week. Um, that seven-year period, and I want to read out of Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, does that sound familiar? We just read it in Daniel. Now we have Jesus talking. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, this is Jesus talking, standing in the holy place, whoever reads let him understand. Do you see, see that part again? Let him understand. Why do we even preach about this? Because the word of God wants you to understand. Okay, so verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. This is talking about the seven years of tribulation. And then you can follow that up by reading portions in the book of Revelation. You can read about it by Paul's writing in uh, Second Thessalonians, and it unpacks that seven-year tribulation that Daniel prophesied about. So this is a power powerful thing. So when, G when Artaxerxes, in Nehemiah's time, the command was given, 483 years took place, 69 70s, sevens, of years, Jesus walked into Jerusalem. This was fulfilled. That's right. To the day. Okay, let's talk about Gabriel for a minute. So Gabriel is the one who comes and gives this prophetic word to Daniel. Uh, in verse 21, it says, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. Uh, so Daniel here, he's in Babylon, remember, not Jerusalem. There's no sacrifice going on. 
And that evening sacrifice was considered the last sacrifice of the day. They believe about three o'clock. Am I correct? About three o'clock. And this prophecy is about the final sacrifice. And we don't see Gabriel again until the New Testament. Do you remember when Gabriel shows up? Okay, you're all like, oh, I'm scared to talk. <laughs> we see Gabriel showing up in the New Testament. For the Christmas story. It's all it's about, all the, about Christmas the Christmas story. story. He shows up to a priest named Zechariah. And he's, John, I remember Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist. And so Gabriel appears to confirm the countdown to the Messiah from the prophecy that was given in Daniel. Okay? So then after he appears to Zechariah, um, he appears to Mary. So we've got the Messiah being ushered in. But when you read the story of Zechariah in the Christmas story, you understand Zechariah is a priest. He's in the temple. He's offering the evening sacrifice, which was what time? Three, Three o'clock, o'clock in the afternoon. It was the last sacrifice of the day. Gabriel shows up and tells him, you're going to have a son. Wow. Yep. Hold those thoughts. Yep. We're going somewhere. Yep. Yep. So, Zachariah's name means God has remembered. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth's name means uh, the it's oath El Shaba. of God. El Shaba. Means oath of God. So, God has remembered his oath. You put them together. They're married, right? You remember that? Okay, so you marry them together. The oath of God. God has remembered his oath. Wow. That's so and they cool. have a son named John whose name means grace of God. It's powerful stuff. Yep. Then Gabriel appears to Mary. We know that story. The Magi come from the east from Persia, where Daniel was. Which is modern-day Iran. And they had record of Daniel's prophecies, so that's how they knew to come to Mary to find the Messiah. Are, are some of you, are you connecting the dots? I'm hoping some light bulbs are going on. Are you connecting these dots? Okay. So in Daniel, God is giving... 70 oaths, uh, and he's saying he would swear to himself. So let's go to Genesis 22, 2. Genesis, the first book of the Bible. God tells Abraham, I swear by myself. I take an oath upon myself based upon what Abraham would do, did. Then uh, Genesis 22, 2. So then God said, take your son, your only son. Does that sound familiar to you? Whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Now, this was a test to Abraham. Is your family mean more to me, or do I mean more to you than your family? Hmm. So he had to honor God, and he had to follow through. Let's back up just for a minute to explain that in Hebrew, the word seven also means in, in prophetic words... Um, Oath and covenant. So that's why we had you go to Genesis 22, because we're going to show you that when God makes an oath or a covenant, which here now we're, we're leading you into Abraham, he made an oath and a covenant. He said, I swear by myself. He takes an oath to Abraham. Now, Abraham has a challenge here. He has a test Obviously, God did not allow him to have to sacrifice his son Isaac, but this whole test is extremely significant in the whole scheme of the prof- the prophetic. God said, I will provide. Abraham said to his son Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb. Mm-hmm. Very important. Moriah, Mount Moriah, is in Jerusalem. It is today's Temple Mount. It is Calvary where Jesus was sacrificed, the same place God showed Abraham to take his son Isaac to. Is this crazy or what? It is Golgotha. Okay, it gets gets even more wild. So Abraham put his son, who was supposed to be the sacrifice, on a donkey. Hello? What are we celebrating today? Jesus went into Jerusalem on a what? Donkey. 
So Abraham put his son, which was the sacri- supposed to be the sacrifice, on a donkey, and they go to the mountain, which he just explained where that was. So 2,000 years later, God puts his only son on a donkey, leads him to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which happened to be the April 6, 32 AD, 483 years after the decree from Artaxerxes. Jesus carried what? Wood. Isaac carried wood to a place of sacrifice. Okay, we we don't have time to read that, but Abraham says to his son, go get the wood for the sacrifice. So Isaac's carrying the wood to make the sacrifice. What did Jesus have to carry? He carried the cross. He carried wood for the ultimate sacrifice. And then when did Jesus die? What time of day did Jesus die? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. The Bible says the ninth hour, according to the timepiece, but it's it's our time. It would be 3 Mm p.m. Wow. According to Luke 23, Yeah, you can look that up later, Luke 23, 44. And what was 3 p.m.? The same time frame, Zachariah was giving the evening sacrifice. Jesus died at the time of the evening sacrifice. So powerful. I'm telling you, God is precise. God is precise in what he does. From the oath of God saying this, I I swear to you, this is what will happen. God has also given another oath in this prophetic word in Daniel of the last week. And God is precise in knowing that that last week is going to come to pass. What does that last week, that seven years look like? We have all the prophecies that we're not going to have time to go into, but just like the prophecies of Jesus and how precise they were to his sacrifice, we are seeing the prophecies being fulfilled leading up to that last week and the things that are going to happen. What happens before that last week? He's the rapture of us, the rapture of us. And once that rapture happens, I'm telling you, the stopwatch, click, there we go. It starts again, and we have that last week. And it's a seven-year period that we call the tribulation. The Antichrist appears, makes a covenant with with, uh, Israel. The temple will be rebuilt. By the way, it's fascinating to understand they've got plans, they've got material, they've got everything ready to go to build the temple today. They're just waiting for somehow the property to be made available. And uh, it's just, it is just a fascinating thing. And we wanted to unpack this and probably did it not the full justice. We but, did it in race form. But you got to understand God is precise. God is accurate. God is mindful of what's going on in the world. He understands what's going on in your life. And he did all this to prove this is such powerful thing if you've doubted God. That no other religion in the world talks about what will happen before it happens. And we're not talking about a religion. We're talking about a relationship with God Almighty who wants you to be in the know. He wanted the people of Israel to be in the know and to not be caught off guard that the Messiah is coming, but they missed it. And unfortunately today, many in Israel, Jewish people, are still missing this amazingly prophetic and historical event that took place. We can trust Almighty God. We can trust Him to go, God, here's my life. Here's my sin. Here's my future. Here's my family. If you were that precise concerning years, hours, and minutes... I certainly can trust you with my life. I can trust you to forgive me of sins. I can trust you to reinstate me into righteousness. I can trust your word. I can stand on your word as a solid rock that I am not building on shifting sand here. I am building on something that is concrete, solid, established, that his word is immovable. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not. You know, last night as we were meditating on this word, there were actually um, tears in our eyes as we 
we discussed as pastors how you've probably noticed in this last year the urgency of our heart, of the urgency of getting right with God and taking care of sin quickly and, and making sure you are in right standing with God. Why is there such an urgency in our hearts? Because we see the prophetic. We see the Bible unfolding before our eyes. And there's an urgency to not only have you right with God, but one more in the kingdom. Why, why do we spend time yesterday? Some of us spent time putting Easter flyers in, in little groups of three with a rubber band around them. Do we do that just for kicks and giggles? No, because there's an urgency in our heart for one more in the kingdom of God for such a time as now. So invite, invite. Why? Because time, we, we see the timetables. We see the word of God that it has unfolded, and we see the things in our world like, okay, let's, let's do this. The let's tell one more. The disciples gathered around Jesus before he went into Jerusalem, and they said, Jesus... When are you going to restore Jerusalem? And Jesus said, I'll tell you. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places, look up because your redemption is so close and rejoice in that. Today, do we hear of wars and rumors of wars? Is there pestilence and famine? We're seeing a, a surge of some famine coming to our world. Next year is going to be different than this year, I guarantee it, with food shortages. Do we hear of earthquakes in various places, odd places? Jesus said, these are the beginning of birth pains, but no, I'm coming back for you. Is there an urgency? Absolutely. People need to get saved. People need to escape the judgment that is going to come to this world. Jesus paid for it. Let's accept it. You know, he's not asking you to just wear blue and only eat Twinkies. <laughs> he's asking you just to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Come to me as you are. Right? For some reason, in our mind, we think that's complicated. Call unto me, and I will respond. Seek me, and you will find me. But somehow, we got this religious goofiness. I got to... I got to do something weird. God just wants you to be who he created you to be, sanctified through the blood of Jesus, and to live a holy life. Be you. Be you. He created you to be you. Just separate yourself from the stuff that is in this world that will destroy you. Live for God. Receive him. And tell this message. Tell this message of good news to everybody and anybody, the king is coming. The king is coming. Would you stand? Holy Spirit, I thank you for your presence in this place. Oh, I thank you right now. You're speaking to hearts, whether they're online or in this, in this building. If there's anything between you and God, I'm going to reiterate what I talked about before communion. It is time to get rid of the sin issue. It is time to get rid of where you are not living for God. You want to be in right standing with your Abba Heavenly Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Pastor Greg. If you're in this place or watching online, we just want to give an opportunity to respond to Jesus. And like we said, it's not complicated. It begins with a prayer. It begins with confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It begins acknowledging that he went to Calvary for you, for me. He went to Calvary for a lost and dying world. And anyone who would confess Jesus that he died for you, confess that and repent of your sin, you will be saved. That's what we got to do. We have to have Jesus in our heart. We got to realize I need to not live for me. I need to live for Jesus Christ. And if you're in this place, 
on the count of three, you need to raise your hand. You need to give your heart. You need to rededicate. Come on, this is a great time. Today's the day of our salvation. Watching online, I'm going to count to three. Respond, raise your hand, and pray this prayer with Pastor Starling. Here we go. One, God is good and he loves you so much. He paid your price to set you free. Two, don't let your mind talk you out of something so easy, something so simple. Three, respond. Raise your hand in this place. Yes, amen, amen. Praise God. You watching online, just respond. Raise a hand. Just cry out to Jesus. Pray this prayer as Pastor Starling leads us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Those watching online, repeat this prayer with those who are raising their hands in this room. Say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I thank you. I thank you. For the blood of Jesus. For the blood of Jesus. That forgives me. That forgives me. Where I have fallen short. Where I have fallen short. Of your best. Of your best. Forgive me. Forgive me. Of my sin. Of my sin. And I ask today. And I ask today. That your blood. That your blood. Would cleanse me. Would cleanse me. Make me right. Make me right. In your eyes. In your eyes. Oh, I thank you. Oh, I thank you. I'm made new. I am made new. A new creation. A new creation. In Christ. In Christ. All things are passed away. All things are passed and away. I, and I have become new. And I become new. Today. Today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Believers, those of you who you're already walking with God, I'm telling you, this week is the is the is the Easter week. It is the time to invite, invite, invite. My husband joke with each other, we call Easter the Super Bowl of church. It is the Super Bowl Sunday where it is time to invite those who sometimes would just tell you flat out, no, I don't, I'm not going to church. But on Easter, they're just a little bit like, well, it is Easter. Maybe I should go to church. Come on. You, you just Be say sensitive it. You just, to you just tell people, hey, where are you going to church on Sunday, on Easter? There you go. Uh, I don't know. We're not really, I don't think we're going. You're not going on Easter? There you go. There There's you your, go. Just, just Come put it on Come with me. Them. Come with me. All right. Pastor Terry. Father, we just lift you up. Everybody just lift your hands. Let's praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Anybody thankful for Jesus this morning? Come on. Let's get your praise on. Thank God for His faithfulness. Thank God for His goodness. Thank God that you don't have to endure one moment in hell because the love of God was sent down for you. Glory to God. Come on. Jesus is good. He is merciful. He is long-suffering. But as pastors have been preaching prophetically, that day is coming. Jesus is coming again. I said, Jesus is coming again. So he's saying to you right now, get ready. Begin to have the anticipation in your heart. What would you do if Jesus was coming back tonight? What things in your life would you throw by the wayside? What things in your life would you allow God to realign? What compromise in your life would you lay down? This is a season of repentance. As John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. A mighty prophet of God, and I believe we are living in those days. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Father, we just lift you up right now. I thank you that there is a holy fear sweeping over this place. A holy reverence for God. A people saying that I no longer desire to have walls of separation that keep me from intimacy from my Father. Walls are crumbling down like the walls of Jericho are falling to the ground. And he's saying, enter into the Holy of Holies, child of God, and come and sit up in your daddy's lap. For I see you just as I see my son. I see you through my son. 
I see you through his blood. So be unashamed, knowing that you've been washed in my blood and robed in my righteousness. And that you can come in, for you are a king's kid. Father, we just thank you right now that, that oh, there's a shift in this place. The presence of God is going to be manifested unto you this week as you get before him in your quiet time. The presence of God is going to touch you. He's going to speak to you. He's going to minister to you if you dare to believe. I just prophesy and declare that you're going to have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand what the Spirit of the Lord is speaking unto you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Well, God is I with us. Oh, oh, oh.